I'm going to share a story with you real quick. I want to read it to you, and um, I want to preach uh, off of this. <clears throat> it's written by A. Helwa, H-E-L-W-A. It's a story about of a, a lumberjack contest <clears throat> that really stood out to me, and it's applicable to what I'm preaching today. A lumberjack, as we know, it's a person who cuts down trees for a lumber company or for personal use or for heating their, <clears throat> their buildings or home. As the story goes, there was a young lumberjack by the name of Jack, and there's a famous lumberjack that most people called Granddaddy, who were competing for a title who could cut down the most amount of trees in a forest in a 24-hour period. So Lumberjack, the young man, he was convinced that his strength and his youth could definitely outfitness older Granddaddy. He, he wanted the title. His granddaddy's been there, and this is when they're using the axes. He's been there for a long time. But the young buck said, boy, I want to have this contest. And before the contest began, each lumberjack was put in a different part of the forest so they couldn't see each other. And young Jack, he was put on one side of the forest. And uh, good old granddaddy, he was put on another side of the forest. And when they were going to start off to cut these trees, they shot the gun. And each one started chopping and chopping down these trees. And they couldn't see each other, but they could hear the axe going. And Jack was saying, Psh, Granddaddy, he's, he must be getting tired because he could hear them. And all of a sudden, his, his cutting would stop. His cutting would stop for quite a bit of time, about 15 minutes. And then it would start again. And Jack was saying, Psh, he's getting tired but I'm not getting tired. And he just kept swinging his axe, and he kept swinging his axe, and he kept swinging his axe, and the trees kept going down. And granddaddy over there, he would go for about an hour, and then after his hour, he would slow down, and he would stop, and he took his 15-minute break. So Jack cut and cut and cut, and he was convinced there was no way he could lose, considering how fast how consistent, how strong he was. He heard, he could hear the, the ax going on. He said, for sure, he can't keep up. I'm, I'm winning. Well, eventually the sun had set and the second gun was fired and it was a signal that the contest had ended. But Jack, the young buck, he pridefully looked over the dozens of trees that he had cut down and he says, for sure, I've won. I mean, I have dozens and dozens of trees. My strength got me through. I've won. So as he walked over and the crowd of people walked and they followed him over the hilltop and then he seen granddaddy there and he looked around and he said, jeez, wait a minute. But when he arrived, he was shocked to see that the old man had cut down many, many more trees. And he said, how could it be? How, how could this old man, and I, I heard him stop and I heard him take that pause how can he have a third more trees than me? How can this happen? Now, Jack didn't understand how it was possible. So Jack went up to Granddaddy. He says, Granddaddy, he goes, I got to ask you, and I, I got to apologize. I wanted your title. I wanted to be the number one man. I wanted to be the big guy on the block. And he goes, but just tell me something. How did you do it? Because I know for sure that you paused almost every hour for about 15 minutes and I heard your ax stop and I didn't hear the chopping. So he says, so what happened? Was, were you cheating? Was, was someone helping you while I was taking place? He says, no, no. And he goes, you're right. I did take, I did take a break. And he goes, well, how did you beat me taking a break? He says, he says, son, he says, it doesn't do good to cut all day and use your skill and this God-given talent you have, he says, because, but you know what you forgot? And he says, no, granddaddy, I don't know what I forgot. He goes, well, let me tell you. He goes, when I sat down, I sharpened my axe. So in 15 minutes, I sharpened my axe. 
I sharpened my axe. So when I went back and I cut, I took twice as much. And when I cut, it made a difference. And every cut that I had, it dug deep and it dug powerful and it was strong and it made a difference. He goes, but you just swung, sw you swung wildly and your axe was dull. And yes, you might be stronger. He goes, but you weren't operating in the best way you could. He goes, that was a problem. And the young man, Jack, says, wow. He says, I, I have a lot to learn from you. And today, I chose this, this neat story because it's the beginning of the year and it's the, our first fruits go to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what he's talking about, comparison, and as Christians, we look at as our acts. You know what our acts is? Our communication, the Holy Spirit, our relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. That's our acts. That's our acts getting sharpened. Is And what do we do in the beginning of the year? We fast. We fast. And you know what fasting is? Fast is sharpening our acts. Fast is saying, you know, Lord, I'm, I'm going and I'm praying to you and I'm going through all the, all the emotions. But, you know, if you do that, but your acts isn't sharp, you know what it is? You're doing it in vain. You're doing it out of your own power. And you know what? You're going to get dull, and you're going to grow tired, and you're going to grow weary. So there's so many foundation, biblical foundation, of where fasting comes from and why we start our year off with a fast and why fasting is so important. I want to share a couple of scriptures with you to give you foundation, and they'll be bringing it up. The name of the sermon this morning is Sharpen Your Axe. And next screen, please. So we see in Ezra chapter 8, verse 21 through 23, before uh, I read the scripture. So Ezra proclaims a fast when the Jews, the Israelites, faced a hazardous travel situation as they returned to Jerusalem from their exile to Babylon, from Babylon. So they're going back to Jerusalem. So while the desire for their safe travel was the immediate reason for their fast, Ezra stated the ultimate goal in this verse. So if you look up there, then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for ourselves, our children, and our gods for I, have, I, for I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect us against the enemy on our way, since we have told the king the hand of our God is for good on all who seek him, and the power of his wrath is against all who forsake him. Now look at that sentence right there. Verse 23, so we fasted and we implored our God for this, and he listened to our entreaty. So he's saying, we see here in Ezra, just exactly what he says. He says, before we started our journey, what did we do? We fasted. Before we started our journey, we prayed. So you know what we do? This is 2024. We're going to start our journey. You know what we're going to do? We're going to fast. We're going to pray. We're going to sharpen our axe. We're not going to do it in our flesh but we want to do it in the supernatural. We want to do it with his blessing, with his anointing, with his leading, with his guiding. And this is what it's teaching us. And we're going to make our way from the Old Testament into the New Testament. So we can look into 2 Samuel. So before I read on 2 Samuel, I have some things that I typed out I'd like to read to you. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 14 through 16, David fasted to seek God, God's healing for his sick son. It was during the intense seven-day fast that David wrote Psalms 51. One of the most heartfelt expressions of repentance in the entire Bible 
The overall purpose of David's fast was not to get God to do what he wanted, but rather to humble and to reconcile with God as he beseeched him in prayer. So if we look at 2 Samuel chapter 12, nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Now let me explain that to you. This is when David, he decided to take Bathsheba, who was a married woman, and then he, he plotted and had David's or had Bathsheba's husband murdered and sent to the front line, and they set him up to be murdered and killed, um, Uriah. And he's done all these things, and God had said, well, David, I'm, he brought and he came to God and asked for in repentance and prayer, and he says, yes, I'm going to forgive you, but he said he was going to take the life of his firstborn son. So Nathan, verse 15, the prophet went to his house, and he says, and the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and he'll become sick. David, therefore, sought God on behalf of the child, and David fasted, and he went and he lay all night on the ground. Now, I've been asked this before. Why would I use this, this scripture? And why would I use this, this scripture as a, as a lesson for fasting and praying? Well, understand this. David had sinned and had Uriah murdered. He had sinned and took another man's wife. And God had punished him and said, I'm taking your firstborn. And then he turned around. And David, when he's fasting and he's pray, praying, he's praying because he had sinned against God. He came and he was coming in repentance for what he'd done. He had a man murdered and he took another man's wife. So he came in repentance and he came to get right before God. And he came apologizing and weeping and crying and saying, Lord, Lord, now. And then the, the beautiful thing, I want to read just an excerpt on this. Um, in in um, Psalms 51, this is the scripture that David wrote that he put to paper when <clears throat> this took place. And David turned around and he... Um, his heart was just broken when he knew that he sinned against God. And Psalms 51, what a beautiful, beautiful passage. And I just want to read a little bit. So remember, this is David. He lost his, his son, is dying. Uh, actually, at this time, he had lost his son, had Uriah murdered. Now he has Bathsheba, of his wife. But what he was doing, he was pleading to God because he didn't want his relationship to be broken with God. So he's pleading with God. He's crying out to God, and he's saying, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. He says, Blot out my sins. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. All cleanse me in my sin. And he just, he's crying out to God, and he's, pray, he's, he's saying, God created me, verse 10, a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. He was worried that he was going to lose his communion with God. And this is the time that David had wrote Psalms 51. He was saying, Lord, don't, don't take your presence. Now this is, he knew the value of his presence and his relationship with God. And he's saying, Lord, don't take your presence from me, God. Lord, please don't take your presence. Forgive me for my sins. Blot out my transgressions, Lord. Fill your Holy Spirit. But his big thing was, Lord, don't take your spirit from me, Lord. Don't take your presence from me, Lord. Lord, you're my existence, Lord. You're, you're everything that I have, my identity. That's what we have to be. Understanding Psalm 51 and David's cry and saying, Lord, my very identity, Lord, is in you. Who I am is in you, Lord. That's who I am, Lord. I have your presence and who you are, Lord. And he's calling out, Lord, don't take your presence from me, Lord. Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. And as he cries out and we, we see this beautiful scripture, so David wasn't fasting and he was fasting and praying and, and he was saying, Lord, if it's your will, Lord, please don't take my son. And I'm sorry for my transgressions. But during that fasting, the reunion between him and God was mended 
It was healed. Repentance came. He's asking for his sins to be blotted out. See, so I want to make sure that we understand this. We don't fast to get what we want. We fast to prepare for what God is going to bring in our lives. Now, I want you to understand that. If you need to put it down, write it down, write it on the tablet of your heart and understand this. We don't fast to get what we want. We fast to prepare for what we're going to go through, what we're going to go through in life. So we fast for our preparation. So David wasn't just fasting because he wanted his son spared, but he was fasting for what he was going to go through. He had to lead people. He had to lead with what he's done to, to uh, Bathsheba's um, husband, Uriah, the, the murder that he's done. Now he, he loses his son. He had to prepare for the journey. So why do we fast? Why do we go in the beginning of the year? Because we fast and pray and say, Lord, this, this year, Lord, belongs to you. Lord, my life belongs. Every day, my breath belongs to you. So it's just like I gave you the story in the beginning. Sharpening the axe is this. Lord, I don't want to be dull. I want my prayers to be meaningful, Lord. I want to be cleansed. I want to come to you, Lord. I, I want to be tuned in, Lord. I want my axe to be sharpened. I don't want to waste my prayerful life, Lord. I want to be fervent in my prayer. I want to be prayerful. Lord, I want to be in tune. I want to be in tune with you, Lord. My axe needs to be sharp. And Lord, I want to be ready for this. And that's why we say in the beginning of the year, first fruits, Lord. I had a time where God, God turned around and he said to me, he said, I needed to, to fast. So share a little bit personal, my personal life. I was in jujitsu, martial arts for a big part of my life. And I liked to go in the gym and I liked to work out. It was just a, a, a hobby and it's something I like to do. It was a stress reliever. And I, I would go in there for three hours, four hours at a time. And... God said, you need to stop. And I said, oh, oh, like during the fast, don't go to the gym. He said, no, you need to just stop. And I said, okay. So we went through the fast. I didn't go to the gym. Ron is my witness. And I used to go there three, four a day, three, four hours a day. I just stopped. I said, I won't go again. So the fast was over. I said, okay, can I go back to the gym now, God? He said, no. And I said, well, when can I go back? He says, when I said, when I say you can go back, you can go back. So for two hours, I could never, two, two years, I could never go back because God said, you've allowed that to become a God of your life. You've allowed that to reign in your life because you've allowed that to consume your time and that became more important to you than me. You, you became, and you've allowed that to take dominion and authority and place. And he said, it has no place in your life. I'm first. I'm the first one in your life. I'm the one you choose first. Put it aside. Two years? Come on. No way. But it's a true story, is it not, Rhonda? So for two years, I didn't go. So two, four year, two years. So when two years later, God said, you can go back. I'm like, all right. But he said, whatever hour you spend there, you spend two hours worshiping me. So I don't go for four hours anymore. So I'll go, you know, I'll go an hour and a half. Psh, I'm gone. Hey, hour and a half times two. I, I'll worship you for two, uh, three hours, God, no problem. So God wants to be first. The story is we fast and we pray, and it's a time of examining yourself. David, David over here, he says, Lord, examine my heart. Examine the spirit that's in me. So we want to make sure our axe is sharp. We want to make sure we're in tune with God. We want to make sure we're serving God. We want to make sure the axe is sharp. David says, Lord, examine me. Perfect good time. Beginning of the year, examine my heart, Lord. Is there something in my life that's more important than you? that has more precedence in you. Sometimes you're an afterthought. Maybe I can squeeze you in. Maybe I can't. But I'm telling you, that's not his passion. That's not his choice. That's what we do to him. That's what we do to God. And we see it in Ezra. And as we're, we're I'm, I'm reading this to you before, Ezra is saying, hey, before we take a journey, he said, Lord, protect us, guide us. Well, you know what? Begin of the year, our fast, before we take a journey, Lord, protect me 
Guide me, lead me in my finances, Lord. Lead me in my health, Lord. Lead in me in parenting my family. For me, I said, Lord, lead me in, in, in being able to lead a church, Lord, and, and in my home. Lord, first fruits, first fruits. That's why when we pay our tithe and offering, God doesn't say, give me the leftovers. He doesn't say, do your budget and give me $5.99. He says, no, first fruits. We want our blessings first, but we don't want to put God first because we have different gods in our life that reign over us. And I, I know this firsthand. Mine was the gym. And God said, no, nope, not having it. And he says, you need to stop and you need to submit it to me, okay? You need to surrender to me, okay? Because it's become a God in your life. You know why I'm saying that? I'm telling you firsthand a lesson I went through, but I'm telling you it's a time of examine my heart, Psalms 51. It's a time of saying, God, examine my heart. Lord, look, Lord, is there something in my house? Is there something in my habit? Is there something in my life? Is there something that's God over me, Lord, other than you? And that's what we're, we're learning here. So we see David. David is fasting and praying. Yes, he was saying, Lord, if we can spare the life of my firstborn son, Lord, God chose to take his son, but David's fasting and prayer prepared him for what was to come. So what is fasting and prayer doing? It prepares us for what's to come. Now, we're going to be handing out these prayer cards. They look like this, okay? And there's another sheet. Uh, we're going to thank you, John. There's another sheet along with that. It talks to you a little bit about, about fasting and praying. Some of you, it may be your first time. And the first week, you'll see it's kind of uh, partitioned off right here. The first one, the first week, it's the needs of our community. Of course, we want to pray and fast for the needs of our community. Week two, I'm asking you to pray. Corporately means you're all invited. We want you to pray for Water's Edge in the church, God's direction for the church body, for the ministries in Water's Edge, how he's going to lead us. Week two. Week three? It's going to be for our schools and for our nation and for our officials, uh, countrywide, statewide. We have a, a presidency coming up. Pray for uh, who God is going to allow to be in, in the, our presidency. So we want you to hang this um, on your refrigerator. We want you to hang this on your bathroom mirror. We want you to corporately be committed to this. And we have right on this, this uh, prayer card, day number one, January 28th, is when we start our fast. So if you're asking your, yourself that question, when do we start? January 28th, we start our fast. So on January 28th, and it tells you what you're praying for at that day, and we explain week number one, two, and number three, we have um, a sheet that tells you how to fast and pray. Now, I want to tell you, if you're confused and you don't know about this, call us. We'll, we'll explain it to you. And I want to say this, and this is my disclaimer for everyone. Check with your physician. Make sure you're healthy to fast. And, you know, I, I wanted to say this. Is a lot of people will ask, well, can we fast from um, an object or something? So right when I put on top of the list, if, um, if you say, hey, I want to fast from my cell phone, you're going to be our hero, okay? So take your cell phone and bury it in the snow, and we'll let you pick it up in three weeks, okay? We'll tell you what. Just throw it in a snowbank. Three weeks, we'll call it, and you can pick it up. There you go. You get it back. Now, if you want to fast from your cell phone, wonderful. But the, the idea and the biblical meaning about fasting and praying is we do something that we're fasting in our flesh. Now, if you're new to fasting, I was tell you, don't try to do a 40-day water fast. I'm telling you, even the Daniel fast is more a fruit and vegetable fast. If you fast one meal a day, if you say, hey, I can't do it because I get sick or this happens or that happens, no problem. You need to customize it to you. You need to be safe. But to do nothing or to take the word of God and say, well, I don't do that, that's not what he says. That's what you say. He's saying, fast and pray. He said, give me the first fruits. And he's saying, come to me with your prayer and petitions. 
So we're trying to show you and line it up biblically. We're going, to go, we're going from the Old Testament to the New Testament. So this isn't something that we're making up because we're being whimsical and we're trying to um, uh, be all spiritual or, man, these guys are a cult or this. And, and you know, we, I, we've told you this before for the new people who miss this. We, you know, we don't um, cut the heads off of chickens anymore. We stopped that tradition a year ago. You know, we still do the snake dance on Friday nights, but that's a whole different thing. That's for a different sermon, a different time. I should explain that, right, because people are going to get all crazy who are watching. <laughs> and I get all kind of crazy text. But anyway, <clears throat> um, let's go a little further. We heard the story of, of Jonah when Jonah preached the Gentile, the city of Nineveh, the whole city came together and they fasted in an incredible act of repentance. This is in Jonah chapter 3, verse 7 through 10. The king of Nineveh ordered every person and their animals to fast and to cry out to mighty God. And yes, let everyone turn from his evil way. Jonah 3, 8. God was moved by their reverence and showed mercy and did not destroy them. So a lot of us understand. We've heard the, the story of Jonah. We have it right up here. Going to read it for you real quick. So I, we put it on the screen so you can see it. We're not pulling things out of a hat. And he issued a proclamation and he published through Nineveh. And this is the king. He says, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast nor herd or flock Taste anything, let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out to the mighty God. Let everyone turn from their evil way and from their violence that is in their hands, who knows, and may God turn to relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw, verse 10, you can see it on the screen, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said and what he was going to do to them. So now think about this story. And we, we know the story really well, Jonah and the whale, and how Jonah was running the other direction. But I want to give you a little bit of uh, foundation on this. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, and the Israelites hated the Ninevites. But let me tell you why. So the Ninevites, when, when the Israelites, they came out of Egypt, and they're, they're coming out, and these are like 3.8 million people approximately. I don't know the whole number, but that's the number that I, I got off of the, the uh, study guide. The study guide, 3.8 million. They turn around and they say, so they're, they're coming out of Egypt, out of slavery. And the Ninevites, they would come and they would rob them while they're going in the caravan. But they wouldn't come where the soldiers, but in the back of the caravan was the, was the, the single moms with the little kids and the pregnant moms and the older older men and the women. So the Ninevites would come and they would kill them. And they would take the women captive and they would steal all their, their, their money and the things that they had and their, the stuff, their possessions. So they would turn around and the, the Ninevites had done this and, and the Israelites remembered that. Hey, th these are the guys who were picking us off and slaying grandma and grandpa and killing single mom. And, and they would not spare the women and the children unless they took them for slavery. So, you know, Jonah didn't want to help them. He didn't want nothing to do with them. And they were heathens, and they were, they were idol worshipers, and they were uh, sacrificing human life. And he's saying, I don't want to go, because but listen to what happened in this story. The Ninevites heard about God. And the Ninevites said, man, are you talking about the Israelite God? Not that God. Because if that God is going to come, and he's going to shut everything down, we're in trouble. So, so, so think of, they knew and they heard of the power of God. Now, how many, about, how many of us that we've heard about the power of God and we're not moved? And we're not stirred, we're not shaken, we're, oh, well, that's fine, God said. No, if, if God said, boom, we got to wake up, God said. And, and he's saying, but the Ninevites, these people weren't even God worshipers, but they knew about God. They knew of God. And they said, if the God of Israel, and if that God, if he's coming to town, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it right. Folks, we need to get it right. We, we want to sharpen the axe. 
And we want to say, Lord, I'm ready. But I want my prayer to be powerful. I want it to be fervent, Lord. I want it to take down mountains, Lord. I want it to move mountains, Lord. Lord, I want to have fervent prayer. I want to have breakthrough prayer. Lord, what do I need to do? Sharpen your axe. Lord, don't take my steak and potatoes. Anything but that. Don't take my steak and potatoes. Because my tummy might be a little hungry. You'll be okay. And I'm, I'm, I'm terrible at fasting. Last year, I did pretty good. I, I've confessed up here in front of everybody, and my fast had the whole church, 500 some people fasting, and I was so hungry. So I went to my favorite roasted chicken, and I went and bought a box of roasted chicken with those big potatoes, and I went out in the country, and I drove out in the woods. <laughs> I mean, I was greasy. I was eating. And then I had to confess in front of 500 people. Hey, you know what I did? So, you know what you do when you goof up? You get back on the horse, right? You fall off, you get back on. Because God gets the first fruits. And let me, Lord, so I'm just telling you, as you read what it is and say, hey, you know, this is my first rodeo. Maybe I can give up a meal. Maybe I'm, I'm going to not eat breakfast and I'll eat a lunch. Maybe I'll eat my breakfast and, and skip a lunch. The most important thing, am I praying? Am, am I reaching out to God? And am I, am I giving God my first fruits? Am I talking to him? That's a beautiful thing. Am I having a relationship? Am, am I checking my body, my flesh? And, and I'll say this to everyone, because you, you can say it to young adults, but today we got to say it to everyone. If you need to throw your snow in the phone bank, you got my permission. Throw your snow in the phone bank, and then when it gets out, oh, throw, throw your phone in the snow bank. And uh, we'll, we'll call it in 21 days. You'll be okay. All right. Well, I'm going to finish up here real quick. Okay, Luke. Luke records a righteous woman, Anna, who served God fasting and her prayers night and day. This is night and day as she awaited God's promised Messiah. And we hear about this story around Christmas time. Ongoing testimony to us shows that fasting is an act of worship. What is fasting? An act of worship. Fasting is an act of worship. Now I'm going to read it. Luke chapter 2, 36 and 37. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband <clears throat> 70 years, seven years, sorry, from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping, fasting, and praying night and day. And this is in Luke. Acts 3, verse 2 and 3. The book of Acts documents the apostles fasting to seize God's will when making decisions within the congregation while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, what were they doing? They were worshiping him and they were fasting. And the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. So what they're showing you here is everything they did, everything they moved on, they fast and they prayed, Lord, show us. Acts 4, 20, 14, 23. And when they had appointed elders for them in the church, their prayer and fasting, they committed them unto the Lord. So before they even made decisions, before they made decisions in this church, what? They prayed and they fasted. 1 Corinthians 7, 5. Do not deprive one another except with consent from one another that you may give yourselves to fasting and praying. So people could say, well, that's an Old Testament. Well, then why do they write it in the New Testament? Well, that, no, they just do that in the Old Testament. No, I just wrote scripture into you. They, they still do it. It's still, we, we're New Testament believers. We're Bible believers. So we're asking you, we're inviting you as a church to corporate prayer. And corporate prayer and corporate fasting. And it's not corporate dying, dieting. Now, if you lose weight while you're fasting, wonderful. Wonderful if you lose your weight while you're fasting. It's not why we do it. So we're inviting you <clears throat> to uh, Water's Edge, 
corporate fast and prayer. Please read through. Do what, what works for your health, what works for you. But, but I'm asking you to do something. So you're not invited to do nothing. You're invited to do something, okay? So, and uh, well, whose parents are over here today? Your parents. Well, you're invited too since you're here. Way to go. All right, I got a thumbs up. Grandma was like this. I need it all the way up, Grandma. <laughs> and uh, so week one is for our community. Week two is for the church and direction for our church. City officials and schools and their safety and security, our nation. So it's kind of plotted out. This is a foundation. You can add to it, of course, but we're asking corporately that you join us starting on the 28th. If you have questions, you can personally call us. Now, I, I want to say this to people so people don't get all weirded out on me, okay? You're not a heathen because you don't do it. I'm saying I'm asking for direction in my life. So making a, a trip to go see my sister who has cancer and her kids. So my thing is I said, Lord, I'm going to fast and pray because, Lord, I need wisdom. Lord, I need the right words and I need the right scriptures. I don't want to do it in my flesh. I want to do it in his spirit. I want him to direct me. And that's what I'm inviting and say, hey, listen, his counsel. Do you have, do you have a, a son and daughter who's not saved or who are not serving God the way they should? Ask God for wisdom and words. And you take a meal or a day and say, I, I'm going to share the word. But I want God's spirit to lead me in. That's beautiful. Folks, sharpen our axe. Sharpen our axe. I don't want to fight the spiritual warfare with a dull axe. Sharpen your axe and sharpen your axe. And some of us have, I have people come to me and say, hey, you know, our marriage is just kind of so, I, I don't have this passion for my wife that I have. I have women say, I don't have passion for my husband that I used to have. Sharpen your axe. Fall in love with them deeper than you ever did before through the spirit of God. Sharpen your axe and say, you know what? I, I gotta have more patience for my kids. Sharpen your axe. I wanna be able to be a better prayer. Sharpen your axe. I wanna have spiritual breakthrough. Sharpen your axe, Lord. I wanna be able to get over anxiety and depression. Sharpen your axe. And this is an invitation and it's biblical. And I'm gonna I'm gonna worship to you. I'm sorry, I want to, but one more. My last, very last scripture up there, very last scripture on, on the PowerPoint. Can you go back to that one for me? Does it show up on the last one around, I think? Okay. If you could go all the way to the last scripture. Ecclesiastes 10.10. 10. If the axe is dull, he does not sharpen its edge, then he must exert more strength, but wisdom to sharpen the axe helps him succeed with less effort. Whew. So, did he make this up? No. A biblical foundation, we have a spiritual battle. And you don't fight that spiritual battle in the flesh. You start in the supernatural. So we need to sharpen our axe. And if you never tapped into the supernatural, your brother, you're in for a ride because it will lighten your jet. And that's a beautiful thing. So let's worship together. Let's stand and worship the King of Kings.